All right, so um, this is the map. of uh, it's, This game is about the Battle of Auschwitz. Uh, the French are the blue pieces over there on that side. The um, Russians and the Austrians are the red pieces over on this side. If you're wondering, the town of Auschwitz is actually off the map. It's right, about right here. Um, this is the north and south side, so it's a little to the east of the map. Um, right. Um, we have some time tracks over here. This is the time track. We're starting at 7 a.m. on the second day. This is the 2nd of December. This is the main scenario we're going to do today. Uh, last year we tried to do the two-day scenario. This year just the uh, one-day scenario, which starts at 7 a.m. and ends uh, at 4 p.m. if we get that far. Uh, we might not get that far because we have this thing called the morale track. This is a Napoleonic battle, so it's all about morale. You know, basically Napoleonic battles were about scaring the other team off the map. So um, we're going to be tracking morale. The red is the Austrians and Russians, the blue force is the French. That was the French start lower. And then we have these two other tracks called the French command track and the allied command track over there. That will be marked for marking commands, and we'll see how that works uh, when we get to that point. Right. Um, Army morale actually can go back, both go up and down. Um, normally it goes down as a result of losing uh, attacks. Uh, it can go up when the French reinforcements come in, it, it can go up. Um, there's also something that happens in a night turn, but we're not doing a night turn because we're only doing the one day scenario. Okay. On the map, you also see these, uh, let's see, several markings. Let's look at um, these things when you see the. Lines, those are setup areas. I've got the commander pieces put out in the setup areas right now. Uh, right. On the sides, we have, uh, th these are just set up just to get the right blocks for setup. Um, of course, this side and that side. Okay. Um, right. Uh, the allies are going to set up first. We'll get to that later. All right. Now, the main thing that you need to see, and everybody needs to see this on the map, is um, the map is divided up. Not in hexagons like a traditional uh, war game, but into locales. And a locale is a polygon. It's bounded by these um, straight lines. So each one of these areas here is a locale. A locale has several things to it. Um, in the middle of each locale, there will be a box and a number. I mean, there will be a number in a box. And um, that is the number of blocks or the number of pieces that can be in that locale um, at any one time. You notice that the, the big areas are going to have a big number here, and the small ones that represent towns are typically going to have four. That's, I think, the smallest that you can have. Right. Um, the lines on the edges on the outside of each locale is called an approach. Approaches are key to the game. Um, notice that there are two widths. There's, um, there's this width that is one block wide, and there are... A, approaches that are two blocks wide. So these are called narrow approaches, these are called wide approaches. Right? Um, also it's important to realize that these have two sides. There's There will be blocks on this side of that approach and sometimes there will be blocks on that side of that approach. And um, the side matters quite a bit. Okay, uh, another thing you'll notice about these locales, about these approaches rather, is that a lot of them have terrain symbols on them. See like for example, there's a cavalry symbol right there and an artillery symbol right there. Those are, um, yeah, they're all over the place. Yep. Um, those are terrain penalties. And um, in all except for one case, they only matter if you're attacking into this locale. So if I'm, if I'm got a piece here and I got a piece here, and this piece attacks this piece, you look at the terrain penalties that are on the defense locale, or the defense approach, the side of the approach that is defending. Make sense? Okay. And then there are X's over this one. Yeah, um, let's talk about what each of them are. Um, the X's mean it's impassable. So um, there's a number of things that you just can't pass through at all. Um, the uh, slash, see there's a slash penalty, that's called cavalry obstructed. And cavalry obstructed just means that cavalry is severely penalized. Um, for example, you see that in towns, as you'd imagine, cavalry don't do very well in cities and towns. All right, also in the woods over there, so um, somewhat similar. And I think along some of the creek, although the gold bock, which is the creek that goes through here, is was actually a pretty minor uh, terrain penalty, so there aren't a whole lot of penalties along the gold bock itself. Although there are some in the swampy areas over there. Yeah. Um, this was a much more serious river over here, and so there's a lot more terrain penalties along the Tawa. Okay, um, right. 
Oh, one thing that I should point out at this point is that just imagine that on every single locale or every single approach that you see here, um, there is a additional um, infantry penalty. He just didn't, or she just didn't want to uh, write uh, an extra terrain penalty on every single one of these approaches. And so um, you just got to mentally remember that there is an infantry terrain penalty on every single approach. Okay. All right. Uh, roads. We have roads on this map. Roads are very important in Napoleon's Triumph. Um, you notice there are two colors. We have this dark red one over here, a big one going through there. That is the primary road. All the other ones are these little uh, dark brown um, roads, and those are the secondary roads. Um, it's much easier to move along the primary. Well, it's faster to move along the primary road than the uh, secondary roads. We'll talk about that later. Okay, uh, we also have little triangles. There's uh, some red triangles on this side. These are the places where reinforcements can come in. Reinforcements only matter on the allied side in the first turn. In the uh, in first turn scenario or first scenario, in the second day scenario, um, those are quite important over there for the French, as we'll see later. So that she knows. Right. Um, then we have objective stars on the map. Everybody see those? They're different colors. They're all blue on that side. Over here we have black, red, and green kind of distributed. And when we talk, that's that's all about the object, uh, the victory conditions. And when we talk about the objectives and victory conditions, we'll talk about how that works. Um, I mentioned that uh, these triangles are uh, towns or villages. There's a bunch of villages out there. Uh, the Santon was a frozen lake down here that uh, a number of Russians uh, got drowned in. Um, Napoleon was able to shoot that thing with his artillery from this hill. And that was a, that was a bad place to be if you're a Russian um, that day. Um, the Prats and Heights are right here. This is kind of a mountain. This is a big mountain. This is the other one. So uh, that was famous in the battle as well, right? Um, this is a this is actually a pheasant garden right here, and um, it had rock walls around it, made a very good defensive place. But it's so defensive that it's completely impassable. So it's more like just an obstacle, really, in this case. Um, the Goldbach I talked about already. It's a river that goes through the middle, and um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, one interesting thing about this map is that um, in a team game, it's actually fairly important to be able to read these town names. So I hope you guys can read the uh, the, the lettering the on, on these. Yeah, the script on these is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, that may be even historical. If the uh, Allied commanders didn't know uh, where they were going, <laughs> couldn't read their maps, then uh, you'll be put in their position on, on that today. Um, it's really kind of interesting see how that goes but good luck with that all right so um, let's talk about the pieces now um, we've got these pieces all over the place and they come in several categories um, the ones with the dot are artillery the allies have four artillery the french have three artillery the ones with a uh, triangle basically two triangles are cavalry and they come in three different strengths which we'll talk about i guess we'll talk about that now um, I'll talk about in the middle. And then um, there are infantry with the X's. And there's a special type of infantry, which is the guards over here. And they're kind of wider, so a little bit different. All right. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, it's probably important to note at this point that the three strength cavalries, there aren't a lot of them. There's three on this side. And I think, are there, how many are there over there? Three strength um, cavalries. Three. Are there three on that side? So okay. same amount. So three strength cavalry, oh, there's two here. Um, the two here are heavy cavalry. Heavy cavalry treated a little bit like the uh, guard infantry. So we'll talk about that later too. Um, basically, if you're interested, um, one of these uh, infantry pieces more or less represents a regiment, about 2,000 men. Um, the cavalry is a brigade of about 1,400 guys. And the artillery has about 30 guns each um, per piece. Okay. Um, so, strength. Obviously, you notice that some of them are one strength, some of them are two strength, some of them are three strength. Uh, that's very important. The number of symbols on a piece, or the strength, uh, represents the morale, essentially. So, a, uh, a one morale cavalry is a Cossack. Um, three is, you know, armored heavy cavalry, more or less. And uh, you'll notice that all the guard pieces um, are three strength because they are, you know, high morale elite pieces. Okay. 
Right. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the positions within a locale that a group of pieces or a single piece can be in. Um, as you'll see later on when we get this set up, it, the idea was that this was um, visually supposed to look like the uh, West Point maps, the blue, the red, the, the lines um, on the map. And you'll see how that works uh, once we get these all set up. But um, notice that uh, right now I have this commander here front. This this guy is a uh, means this is a core, um, and the pieces can either be hidden or that's called face down the way it is, or they can be face up where you can actually be, you know, everyone at the table can see what it is. Okay, so the positions are not literally. You could put them face down if you want to, and sometimes when they're on on the side and you potentially could see it over there, I might want to actually turn it face down. But normally I just turn it so that only uh, only my side can see it. Okay, so face down versus face up. Good. Um, yep. All right, um, this is the most important thing I've said so far. Your pieces are either going to be on an approach, that's called blocking an approach, or they're going to be in the center, and that's called being in reserve. So center of a locale is in reserve, um, blocking an approach is, is on the approach itself. Okay, makes sense to everybody. Good. All right. Um, uh, these guys, like I said, are the core commanders. Okay, and um, they're going to be uh, initially commanding um, a core. A core can be a number of units attached. Uh, can have a number of units attached to it. So the minimum, really, um, the minimum number for at setup time is this number on the board. Can everybody see those numbers right there? Uh, three, four, little in a little circle. That is the minimum number of units in the board that has to be assigned to the core at the beginning. Now, during the game, the minimum number is just one. If you ever lose your last uh, unit, then the uh, core commander is out of the game. And, uh, he's dead. Out of the game. Anyway, um, the maximum number that you can have in a core is eight. Just got to remember that. Eight is the maximum you can have in a core. All right, so I'm going to talk about the victory conditions now a little bit. Um, there are no draws at all in this game. Um, you either win or lose. Okay. Although it is a team game today, so um, there's not an individual winner. It's just your side wins or, or loses. Okay. There are two kinds of victory conditions. The um, decisive one has to do with uh, the morale track. Um, you win a decisive and immediate uh, victory if the other team's morale goes off the track, goes to zero. Okay. All right. Um, that's actually the most common way that um, the game's in, really, because people like attacking each other. Um, yeah, uh, the only rule about that is that the final uh, loss that takes you down to zero uh, can't be from an artillery attack or from committing uh, the guards, uh, the guards, because when you commit the guards or you commit your heavy cavalry, you suffer a morale penalty, but that can't drive you off the bottom. So one tactic is to wait until you're way down here at the end and then commit your guards, and it doesn't hurt you to commit your guards at that point. It sort of motivates you to you know, wait um, to do that, as the historical commanders did. Okay. Um, so if you get all the way to uh, the 4 p.m. turn, then the game is decided in by the marginal victory conditions, which is the control of objectives. Okay, and that's these um, triangles. I mean, these stars that we talked about. Right there. So um, this is the way that works. In order to control one of these stars, and of course, you know, you start off, the allies, I mean the French, start off in control of all the blue stars because they're there, and, um, and vice versa with the allies. Um, in order to control one of your enemy stars, you need to have a core on it, first of all, not just a detached piece, so it'll be one of these commanders. And that core has to have either infantry or artillery. In other words, you can't just send a purely cavalry corps over to the other side and, and count that as control. And you have to be able to trace a path along any road um, to the primary road entry hex. So it's you got to be able, to, for the allies, you got to be able to trace back to one of these two um, locales right here. For the French, you have to be able to trace back to that one. Um, it can be along smaller roads, but it's got to go all the way back to uh, that one. Entry lookout. So basically, you have to take a uh, objective and have a um, 
clear path all the way back to um, basically your depot area. Okay, um, right. And so there are two conditions, and, and the thing that really kind of sets the overall tone of this game is that um, the conditions change if the French bring in their reinforcements. One thing I forgot to mention is that um, the French in the second day scenario are available to bring in Bernadotte as a, a, a reinforcement immediately because he was available the day before. They can't bring in Debu until the 8 a.m. turn, although nobody ever brings him in that early. You normally bring him around, around noon or 1 o'clock, something like that. Um, so, at the beginning of the game, the important thing is that the French haven't brought in their reinforcements. They're off map. When the French reinforcements haven't come in, then these are the marginal victory conditions. The Allies win if they have at least one blue objective. So the Allies have got to control one of these blue ones. This is the closest one. That one's also common. This is probably the most common one that they, that they get to. The Allies have to uh, control one blue, and the French may not control any green, red, or black. So the Allies have to keep the French out of all of this area over here and get a blue. Okay, What that means is that the um, burden of attack is very clearly on the Allies at the start. In other words, the French are winning at the beginning, so the, the Allies have to do something about that. All right, after the reinforcements come on, it becomes much, much harder for the French to win an objective victory. So basically when they bring on their reinforcements, it's in, in order to uh, essentially try to get a morale victory at that point. Okay. Um, the, the rules are, um, at that point, after reinforcements, the Allies win if they have a blue or the French do not have any of these. So at that point, the, uh, the Allies don't have to get a blue anymore. They can forget about blues. They just start pulling back, which is what they try to do. And all they have to do is defend the uh, red, green, and the black out there. Um, and I, I don't know, if, I want to restate that. The Allies win if they have one blue or the French do not have at least one green, red, and black. So the French have to have one of each color. And they're kind of broken up by areas. Like this is the green, this is sort of black, and this is kind of a red area. Or there's some black over there too. And the Allies can win just by denying the French any of those colors. Yes. Yeah, right. Uh huh. And so the French win if they have at least one green, red, and black, and the Allies have no blue. And if that uh, doesn't quite make sense the first time you hear it, you know, we'll talk about it later. But again, it doesn't matter until you get to the very end. And like I said, most games um, end with the morale victory anyway. Um, but it does motivate, it, it does set the burden of attack. It, it says that the Allies have to attack, and then later on it says that. Um, it's going to be a lot harder, and the, the, the burden of attack switches to the French when they bring in their reinforcements. So is there any difference between them bringing in one or two? If you brought one, you nope. just bring the second one? Yep, no. bring them both in right at the same time, no. absolutely. Yeah. And another question about the timing, it's that the control objective is only at the end of the day. That's right. So you yeah. said the four reinforcements means the French never brought the reinforcements in. It is possible, right. They, you start the game without reinforcements, right. with the reinforcements off map, and it is possible to never bring them in. I say that the four reinforcements condition can only apply at the end of the day. Well, it, all of these uh, marginal conditions mm -hmm. only apply. Right. So end. I'm saying the control objectives only applies there, so the new reinforcements, if, if we could look at those, that means the four reinforcements, mm -hmm. it meant all through the day, the French never brought them in, right? If we look at yes, otherwise that, they never yes, get to the before yes, that, That's correct. I see what you're saying. So, so the French right. need to win without reinforcements if they want this yes um, objective. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Unless the um, unless through casualties and things, the French just have themselves in a very superior position. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is sometimes possible to be in such a good position that you can bring on your reinforcements and it won't hurt the French. Okay. But they have to be doing very well. Yeah, yeah if they're already all the, all the colors or something. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay, so um, kind of an overview of uh, the rest of the game. Um, the main action of the game is moving pieces. You move pieces by using commands. In each round, the Allies perform all of their commands first, and the French perform all of theirs. So sometimes I move this kind of, uh, this is like the Allied part of the turn, and I put it in the, the line between the two, and that's the French part of the turn. Just kind of track it that way. Um, 
Yep. Um, to make a move that is not an attack, this is how you do it. Let's say I want to move this um, this core right here, just uh, from this this locale to that that locale. What I would say is, um, I would say, uh, well, actually, I just physically grab it um, in this case. I'd say which these are all moving together. Um, they're making a core move. I'll talk about commands in a minute, and you just move them from one locale to another. Um, I'm going to talk about which locale. I mean, which kind of commands you use. Yeah, which kind of moves you can make in a minute. Sorry, it, it's the second to last day of the con, and it's kind of <laughs> yeah. catch, catching up with me a little bit here. Okay, um, I haven't slept a lot this week. Right, um, so anyway, the Allies do all theirs first, and the French do all of theirs. Um, uh, yep. And the important part is that when I um, make a move, I will announce a command, and that command will usually be a core type of command or an independent type of command. And let's say it's a core command, and it's, I'm using Bagration, which is this guy. I'll move it, and the French player who's sitting over there will move one of those um, to mark that command as being used. Okay? So your opponent updates the command track. All right. Uh, moving into an enemy-occupied locale is an attack. All right? Um, what I want you to remember is that um, when attacking, did not announce which pieces are moving. And don't think out loud. Don't say, well, I think I'm going to do this, you know, um, because that kind of ruins the game. Instead, what you want to do, let's see, let's just say there's pieces right there, and, and I have this core right here. Um, what you would do, instead of saying, I'm moving this into that, don't say that. Don't do that. Everybody get that. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. Um, just point to this approach and say, this is the attack, or an attack threat here. Okay, that's the word. An attack threat there means attack threat across that approach. Um, that means you are going to be moving something or trying to move something across that approach into the uh, enemy area. Okay. Um, even even firing artillery is treated like a movement, so um, we'll get to how that works later. Um, some things to know is that um, blocking an approach is um, generally much better for defense. Um, it's also where you want your artillery to be. Um, artillery are literally just about useless in reserve, um, but they're much better um, blocking an approach. Um, you know, but uh, on the other side, uh, things move a lot faster um, when they're in reserve and they're more flexible there as well because they can defend multiple um, directions rather than just the approach. When they're on the approach, they're only going to be able to defend the approach. Okay. Um, yep. Yep, yep. In fact, I guess while we're talking about that, um, you can think of uh, units that are on an approach, that are blocking an approach or filling an approach, is another word for it. Um, you can think of them as being deployed, uh, using the terrain, uh, you know, maybe even if they're infantry, maybe they're in lines or even a, a square formation, that kind of thing. Um, if they're in reserve, they're really in a more mobile situation or a more mobile formation, maybe the march column, that kind of thing. Yeah, one of the things that is sort of a criticism about this game is that um, people who play a lot of Napoleonic games kind of struggle to connect the mechanics of this game with the actual how Napoleonic things work. So I'll, I'll kind of point out some of those um, connections um, as we go. Um, yep, it takes a few, and the other thing about this is it takes a few games to really get comfortable with what's going on, so um, just be aware of that. Alright, so I'm going to talk about commands now, I've been referring to them, I'll talk about them a little bit. There are two basic kinds, uh, or two classes of them, there's core commands and there's independent commands. You'll notice that on the co command track you got a space for independent and spaces, individual ones for core commands. There are three types of core commands, the most common one is a core move. Um, in a core move, um, you take everyone in the core and they go somewhere, like that. Um, you actually, you can leave behind um, pieces in the starting location if you want to, but that is, um, would be sort of an unusual thing to do. Mostly you want to keep the core together when you can, although not always. Um, the second one is called a detached move. In that case, you are splitting up the core the core commander has to stay in the in the uh, place that they started, um, but any number of pieces can be detached from that core and can move. That would be like a detached move. Okay. Um, the odd little thing about detached move is you cannot uh, move by road uh, when you're doing a det 
attach move. So um, as I'll talk more about in the next section, um, this is a core move might be starting even back here, let's say. You go one, two, three, because you can move three along a primary road. Um, however, if you did a detach move, you cannot move along the road, so they would have to stop there at that point. Okay. Um, to do any of those three core commands, you have to be in a core, or the piece that's being moved has to be in a core. Um, there's also a class of commands called independent. There's no subdivision of these. It's just called a unit move or an independent command. Those are almost equivalent. Which was the third? Oh, the attach. Yeah, the attach. Well, the attach isn't used all that often, but it can be. Um, if there's a detached uh, piece there in the exact same location, whether it's in reserve or whether they're both um, blocking an approach, um, you can attach one piece, only one piece, um, one detached piece into the core. That's how you can rebuild the core. Um, it's a very slow process because you can only do one per turn. And you can, the core can explode and break up into individual pieces in, in one attack. So then it takes half the rest of the game to <laughs> put them back together again. So, yeah. You only get one core command. Core. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, and sometimes not even that on the allied side. Um, there's, they're even more limited. So, right. Uh, so, uh, one command per commander per turn. And here's the key um, the allies only get five, they can only give five core commands each turn, uh, and three independent. The French can do eight. In other words, the French can activate all of their core, um, even the ones that are off the board. If you know, Once they're on the board, they can uh, devil and burn it out. Once they get them on, then they can activate eight, and they have four uh, independent. So as you can see, there was a big command advantage um, to the French over the multinational, um, very confusingly organized um, allied army. Uh, so. That's a big advantage for the French. <laughs> okay, uh, it's important to remember that each piece each uh, can move only once per turn, uh, but you can be attached. You know, you can, like for example, if this core started here and I did a, um, a unit move to move into the same location, then uh, this guy could issue an attached move and uh, or attached command if it can combine like that. Okay, because attaching is not moving. All right. Oh, so the attach is a command for the core, yes, not for the independent. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Um, all moving pieces must end the move in the same position. You cannot drop off during move. And we talked about how you mark commands um, as the opponent uses them. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk about the movement itself now. Um, be specific about this. There's really only four ways that you can move. You can move from a reserve to an adjacent reserve. You can move from a reserve to the inside to a blocking position in an approach. Okay. If you start on an approach, you can either move backwards into the reserve or you can move forward into the opposing reserve. Those are the four ways you can move. All right. Everybody good with that? As we're, as we're Any connection that's not an X. Right. Yeah. You can't cross the impassable sides. That is true. And, you know, the other thing to look at is um, is uh, the, capa the capacity. Oh, okay. So if this is a big capacity, um, I, I couldn't move in there yeah. because um, it would be over capacity. Right. Okay, those are, so there's off-road and then there's road, and, and what I just described was the off-road. Um, that's the, the basic one. That's the most common one, um, the one that you should know. And then there's also road movement. Road movement is one of the places where this game gets a little bit complicated sometimes. Um, on a primary road, this big red road over here, you can move three, unless something blocks you, you can move three. Uh, locales um, in one move. So one, two, three would be a uh, legal move. Yeah. Um, or two along a secondary road or a combination of secondary and primary. You can also move um, two along. So one, two. Okay. Um, yep. Normally, almost always, it, you're, when you do those road moves, you're going um, from reserve to reserve. There is one uh, situation where you could do something else if you're 
if you're a unit, and it, it, let's say you got an independent, let's say you have just a uh, one calorie piece, and it's going to move by itself on a road. Um, the cavalry piece may, well, let's, see, let's start here, um, can do this. You can go one, two, three, and then they can continue on to the um, approach. They can continue on and, and fill an approach as long as that approach is bisected by the road. Okay, one, two, they couldn't go there and then go to go block this approach because the the road doesn't go across that approach. Okay. Since they move three, it can only be the primary road approach. Yeah. Not the secondary road. Uh, that is correct. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. right. Yeah, good point. Um, that that move is not used very much. It's kind of unusual. Um, it's called cavalry continuation. Um, but this January, I um, actually discovered a use for that, and I wrote an article about it on, uh, on the Geek. So if you're interested, um, it's it's kind of like treating that cavalry as a as a horse artillery. It's a way to defend a position from remotely. It's kind of like detaching the horse artillery out to uh, defend a position. So yeah, that's how that works. Um, if you do that, though, uh, you have to turn the piece up at the end of the move to show that it's uh, cavalry. Okay. No, right. It's only a no. It's a, all cavalry, so it can be a formation. Doesn't it? Be it could. Yeah. It could. Yeah. It could be that. All right. All right. The key thing here is that to attack by road, to attack using road movement, all the pieces have to be cavalry. It can be a multi-unit cavalry corps or it can more often um, be a detached cavalry piece. But it's got to be cavalry if it's going to attack by road. You can move by road if you're not attacking, but if you're attacking and you're going by road, you have to be cavalry. Okay. Um, also, it has to be feint, um, which we'll talk about more when we get to the attack um, sequence. All right. Yep, um, so they're kind of a harassing or skirmishing attack. They're not really a serious attack, but if you find an open flank that no one can defend and you make a road attack, then bad things are going to happen uh, to the other guy, pretty much. Okay, um, the, you'll notice that sometimes you get to a place like, um, I don't know, where's, where's the situation? Where there are two roads in a place that aren't connected. Uh, for example, I might move into this, I might start off here and then move into that space. Um, that's two spaces by road, right? And then next turn, I might leave that using a different road. There to there. Makes sense. I came in on this road, and I had to follow this road while I was coming in, but at the beginning or in between my turns, I can essentially switch from that road to that road. And move the tools are independent. Yeah, yeah, they're independent. Okay, um, but within one turn, of course, you got to follow the road. Um, you will be studying the roadmap only me as you check this out as you try to play it. Okay, so Just now like we the real generals. Yeah, <laughs> right. No kidding. It does put you in their place in a lot of uh, areas. So let's get to the first part of the rules that actually sometimes confuses people a little bit, and that is the rules for multi-unit core moving on roads. So we're going to have our little multi-unit core right here, and, and remember that this is a multi, this is a two or more piece core. You can have a one uh, core or one piece core, and most of these rules don't apply to that. Um, they act more like a detached unit, more or less. But a multi-unit core moving on a road has some restrictions. Um, when a multi-unit core enters, let's do the first one. When a multi-unit core enters a locale via road. We're going by road. Um, nothing else can enter that reserve for the rest of the turn. So we've marked out with the black disc. For sure. Okay, thank you. So I would just put one there, and I would also put one there. Oh, both okay. of them. Yeah, okay. I went one, two spaces like that. Okay, and that's what this cheat sheet says here, is that if multi-int core enters a locale by road, and when it enters it by road, it's always going to enter into the reserve area. Um, then nothing else may enter that reserve. So even if I have a um, single piece, it, it can't come into it. Um, essentially, this is representing that it's all those guys are strung out along the road, and it's just blocking um, movement in that area. Uh, other units can exist there? Yep, yeah, they can have been there. Mm -hmm. um, they can move out of it. Uh, 
but they just can't put nothing into it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, the second rule is that, um, except for the first rule, um, when anything enters a reserve area, so uh, this could be, this, this could be, uh, we can leave that there. Let's move that. When, let's say this, this enters that right there. I mean, it, it's just a cross country move across those two right there. Um, then um, nothing, that, no, then a multi-unit core may not enter that reserve for the rest of the term uh, via road. Yeah, multi-unit core may not enter that reserve area via road for the rest of the term. So we put that there to say that that second condition can't happen. Again, it's explained over there. So I couldn't, I could move this cross country in like that. But I couldn't move it along a road through that space. So the big the big train needs a lot of space to move, and if anything's blocking it, then it's not going to be able to do it, and vice versa, it's going to block other people from uh, being able to move through it. Okay, uh, if you forget those, it's written right here. Everybody's got a copy of it, so you can look at it. Great. Um, and then my personal favorite, a multi-unit core moving by road must stop when entering a locale adjacent to an enemy multi-unit core. So, um, if, let's just do an example of that. Um, yep, let's say there were, uh, there's a multi-unit core there, and these aren't, if they were just three independents together, or by themselves, no three problem. detached, no problem. But if they're organized into a core, then they become a problem. So let's say I start right here. Um, you can think I can move well, three, right? Because it's a primary road. One, two, can I move again? Uh, no, I can't. I can't attack in this situation because a multi-unit core cannot or, or must stop moving as soon as it gets to a locale that is adjacent to another, to an enemy multi-unit core. So even if this was a big cavalry, it had all the heavy cavalry and everything, um, it couldn't attack that right there for that rule, that reason. All right. Okay, so the cavalry attacks by road are only against individual units? Yes, that would be accurate. Yes. Or a single unit core. It could okay. be a single unit core. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, it is individual. It's, it's either detached or it's a one unit core. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, um, I tend to forget that rule sometimes um, when I'm attacking things, so um, that would be something to try to remember when you're playing. Okay, um, lastly, thing about our road movement is that it is okay to move through a locale that when, where you exceed the uh, locale limit or the yeah the number of pieces limit. So I can move along this uh, road even though I've got five pieces and the uh, maximum is four. I can move through it as long as there's no way for me to be uh, forced to stop in this area. Um, and the way that you're sometimes forced to stop in that area is by enemy pieces. So if their enemy pieces aren't anywhere close, it's no big deal. You just, you just go right through it. Um, but if there's a possibility that uh, this uh, enemy that's right here uh, won't retreat when you make that second move when you make that attack Then it's not a legal move because you might get blocked in an area and over the locale limit All right, it took me like six years to understand how that works <laughs> actually. Um, But uh, but now I understand it and that is um, Simply all that there is to that really Okay, um, great. That's movement. Um, we'll talk, I'm sure, a lot more about that when you guys actually get um, the new pieces around. Um, but let's talk about reinforcements. We talked about the time when they're allowed. Uh, we talked about where they come in on the um, blue diamonds or blue triangles down there. Um, they are not allowed to enter if the enemy somehow occupies your entry lookout. So they can be blocked. Um, they do come in by road. Um, usually core move, and in fact, uh, the French get two moves for the core when they bring them on as reinforcements. So each move gets a, each core gets a double move when they come in. All right. Um, also, the French are happy to see their friends coming onto the map, and so they get four uh, morale. Um, 
bonus when the um, when the uh, reinforcements come in. That's very helpful usually. And uh, as we talked about before, the um, victory conditions change massively at that point, and the French now have the burden of attack when they bring on the reinforcements. All right, how are we doing? Everybody, all right so far? So far, okay. so good. All right, crank it. Good. So um, let's. You did say the allies don't have reinforcements. That is true. Okay. They're they're going to be all on the board um, in the first turn. I mean, in this scenario, the one the first day scenario, the one that is not played very often. Mm -hmm. um, all except for two of their core are reinforcements. Oh, okay. so and that one it's all about reinforcements. Yeah. Um, but the second day scenario, it, it's not so much. They all start on the board. All right, great. So uh, the team is obviously a good two-player game. Most people play it two-player, but I think it really shines as a multiplayer. Um, it, it's just an added dimension. It adds to it. So uh, we're going to experience that today. So what we're going to need to do is um, break up into teams here in a minute. And um, the kind of starting point to that is to realize that on each team there is one uh, commander-in-chief. And this needs to be a take charge, uh, make it happen, um, you know, driver type person. Um, the, and then we're also going to assign um, ranks to the other players. So it'll be like a, a second in command and a third command. Um, what I like to do is have three players on the French side and two players on the Allied side. Partly that's because of the number of commands. You know, the French have eight, core and four, and, and uh, the allies have fewer. So it kind of works out about right, in my opinion, uh, if we have three on that side and, and two on this side over here. So we will need to do that. Um, we won't actually do that until I read the rest of this stuff. Um, the commander-in-chief is going to assign the core to players, uh, each core to a player. Um, can assign some to himself, of course, and, and some to you know other people. Individually, um, the allies are going to set up first. Oh, and the the CNC also assigns the individual units to the corps. So really, the commander, but obviously he's got help from his, his people. You know, y'all can talk about it as you get set up. Um, yep, allies are going to set up first. Um, there's a rule that says Davu and Bernadotte must each have one, at least one unit that is not a two strength infantry. You can't just put the worst French pieces on the reinforcements. For obvious reasons. Be one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they don't have one infantry there? No, they don't have any ones. Um, only only the uh, allies have one. Essentially, this is a contest, classic contest, really, of um, numbers versus quality. Uh, the French are better, but they're not quite as many of them, especially before they bring in their reinforcements. Yeah, so there are some, there are some one, like I said, these are the cavalry ones or Cossacks, and um, I'm not sure what the one infantry represent just mm -hmm. very low morale um, troops. French don't have any of those. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so then there is a, a tweak to the French setup. Once the French get all their pieces in core out here on the board, then they uh, have this detached thing. And um, this goes from the CNC on the French side down to the uh, least senior. The French can detach up to six units total um, and move them a maximum of two locales away from where they start. Um, and they need to be not adjacent to any red, green, or black objectives, which means they can't be up here this, in this area right here. Um, yeah, and so the, the French get to spread out a little bit, essentially, during setup. Helps them quite a bit. Um, then there's another French wrinkle, <laughs> in that one of those three French artillery over there is going to be considered the fixed battery. The fixed battery works like any other um, French artillery with one exception. It just can't move ever. It's stuck wherever it is. That's why we call it fixed. And the traditional place for it, the place that it was in the battle, um, is here on this hill called the Santon, which was um, a very sharp, small little uh, hill. And uh, you don't have to put it there. You can put it in other places. Um, I have some suggestions if you're curious. But um, that place works pretty well. Um, there is an optional rule that kind of changes the way the Santon works, um, but I don't like explaining it in the first game, so uh, we're going to skip that one today. All right. Um, on a side, players uh, move in the order of the most senior to the least senior uh, commands. Um, you can move, of course, you know, you, you can obviously order, uh, give the command to your own uh, core. Like if, 
if you have if you're in charge of Milorovic, then you're going to be the one that's issuing the core command for Milorovic that turn. Um, but for detached units, um, you can move the detached unit if your core or one of your core is nearest to the unit. Um, higher seniority of tide, tracing path can actually go through enemy occupied locales, but not impassable approaches. All right, defending and retreat decisions are made by the closest core commander. Also, same kind of thing. Um, core, and this usually, if two core are in exactly the same place, this is a core, same place, they can usually attack together. But in the team game, that can't happen unless both of these cores uh, belong to the same player as well. So it encourages you to assign fronts. Yeah, very much so, right. Yeah, you, although the, the, the Russians didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. The Austrians <laughs> had them all mixed up. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, right. You can't detach from another player's core to attach unless you're more senior than that player. <laughs> I might not have mentioned that um, that when you do an attach command, you can, in addition to picking up a detached unit, which is what normally happens, um, you can, you know, if, if you were, let's say that was a detach, you, normally an attach command would be something like that, right? But it is also possible to take one out of another core. <laughs> yeah. Seniority doesn't matter. Yeah. You need your cavalry. Yeah. No, it, it does matter in that one. Um, okay. So it says, cannot detach from another player's core to attach. Oh, unless you're more senior you than that player. So I guess you can take yes, it away. Yes. Yeah. How about I that? Got those privileges. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've never seen that happen, but that could be funny. It could be great. Okay, now here's the best rule of all. You ready? No communication between team members except by written orders. All right. I mean, none. <laughs> none. This, this is really what makes this, this game amazing. Some people, sometimes you just want to strangle the guy. Right next to you. I mean, just, just don't do it. Don't do it. But you can't say anything. Okay. So, um, so please abide by that one. Um, that's so much fun. All right. So only the CNC and only the CNC uh, may write orders at the start of each of his turns. At the beginning, before you do any moves, you got these pieces of paper right here. Notice there's three on this side because there's three uh, people on the allied side, and there's two on that side for because there's two people on the French. You're going to use one piece of is paper. It, is it the, person? the other way around? Uh, yeah, sorry. There you go. Right. Okay. So you're going to use one piece of paper uh, for one person. Um, you know, it's going to might as well put his name on there, I guess. And here's the idea. Um, what you write on uh, each turn, you can just add them all turn by turn here, is just a one-liner. Um, it has to start with attack or defend, the word attack or defend. And then you can just leave it at that. Um, or you can put one or more of these lovely uh, written um, uh, words, something that is written on, on, the, uh, on the map. Um, if you can figure out how to write it, um, you know, and spelling is optional, I guess. Um, you write it on there. So you can, like, say, defend, uh, you know, Pratzeburg and Star of Interati and, and Pratza, or you can say attack, um, you know, if you can figure out what that says. Uh, that's actually an A right there, believe it or not. If you can, uh, you can say attack that area or attack, you know, uh, Blasowitz or whatever. So, um, yeah, zero to three uh, locations, actually as many locations as you want, um, but it starts off with attack or defend. Okay. Um, one order per round per player, and uh, the other fun thing about it is that when you write it on this turn, the guy doesn't get to read it until the beginning of the next turn. So there is a true time delay thing going on here. You're sending a guy on a horse <laughs> We're carrying this message. Yeah, right. We're um, supposed to be here. Yeah, right. So, Do we um, actually need one less piece of paper because the commander in chief doesn't give themselves? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah, right. No, so, no, they don't need to write what they're doing. Yeah, no. Nah, okay. Yeah, they don't need to give themselves one. Just a mean of who needs that, That's true. Yeah, yeah good point. All right. Um, oh, yeah, and orders do not need to be followed. And often they don't. <laughs> a lot of times people just laugh. When well, it's, the, it's you know, the next day. So, things yeah. change. Yeah. Next <laughs> hour. Yeah. 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 And, well, yeah. And orders are optional. Um, the commander in chief does not have to write orders. Um, I know people that play this game that think that they do more harm than good. You know? um, and so that they, they just don't do it. But I think it's players that you do. I like reading them yeah. afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty great. All right, awesome. So um, here we are. We're time to divide up into two teams, and um, 
start all that setup process that I've been talking about. So, do you go over how to do the attacks after we set up? The yes, system? and after, after we move, moving. and after we move just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I like, I like to give everybody kind of a kind of a break um, before we get into that. That is work. So this is the point where um, the CNC can write orders to each of his um, people. Oh, and by the way, um, who is second in command on your side? Asher. You should make a. What does Chris will be second? What does second in command do? Second in command has um, moves second. First of all, he, he'll, Ash will move first, he'll move next, and then okay. he'll move. And um, he'll have a little bit more pull than you will in terms of commanding uh, detached units. But since you're so far apart from each other, what will actually happen will be Asher will have um, the, you know, he'll win uh, all the uh, decisions when they're here equal distance apart. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is we need to talk about um, core assignments. So as I understand it, Chris is... Um, Commanding uh, Lon and Mira and Bessier over there. Um, we, yeah, we. <laughs> <laughs> Asher is uh, commanding only the small core of Van Dam in the middle there, as well as the two reinforcements of Davu and Bernadotte. And then uh, Kevin has uh, Saint Hilaire here in the middle, and uh, Legrand all spread out um, down there in the south. And as you can see, they've made some detachments. Other folks. Okay, so uh, on this side, Randy, who do we have? CNC. All those. So, Bagration, Constantine, Constantine, uh, learn how to pronounce that in Russia this summer, Kolobrat, Milorodovich, and Prokoshevsky. Okay? And then on uh, your side, Julian has Lagaron, Liechtenstein, Doktorov, and Keenmayer. All right. <coughs> Excellent. So, that's pretty uh, pretty clear division of responsibilities. Um, we got that. So, yep, time to write orders, and um, and people here are getting these orders don't peak because you don't get to read it until the beginning of the next time. All right, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see. Oh, how yeah, you probably need to read this this map. I am going to get up out of the way. I'm fine. Well, it, okay. let's see how he's going to interpret this. All right. This all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. So, of course, you can talk to each other. You just can't talk to each other. Or not the way. You have to be quiet, oh. otherwise. Well, that's what I was saying. That's why he's going. <laughs> <It'll just be laughs> all over. Yeah. Oh, and there is actually a rule that the orders cannot contain, like, code words. They have to mean <laughs> what they say. <laughs> so, are they, are they limited to attack, defend, the location? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's it? Yes, that's it. So, there's not much code words to be had. Yeah, well, <laughs> apparently she. I guess the location name is right. misspelled. Exactly, so exactly. If the first letter is misspelled. <laughs> <laughs> the last letter is misspelled. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So you got those handed off yes. here to uh, lieutenants there. All right. Awesome. Okay. Great. So we start with the Austrian half of the seven a.m. turn, and you are the uh, most senior player on this side. So you may give as many commands as you want to, and realize that. If you give if you give all five core commands, then he has no core commands at all to give. Okay. All right, you're up. 